Welcome to another conversation on Business Redefined. We want to look at Capital Markets Outlook 2022, and we are privileged to have the man in charge of the exchange, Mr. Jeff Odundo, as always, delighted to have you on set. Pleasure, Julian. Jeff, let's begin by having a slight recap of 2021. I was looking at the year vis-a-vis -vis 2020. If you look at the benchmark indices looking a little good, especially the NSE All Share 25, 20 not quite. But looking at it from an equity turnover standpoint, it looks almost like a flat line. Yeah. Does that bother you, Jeff? Well, um, we were very optimistic last year about uh, how the markets would perform. And um, we, we actually uh, did expect to see almost a 10% growth in our equity turnover. Uh, but I think the early part of the year, the knock-on effects of the COVID-19 uh, um, impact continued to affect the markets. So we sort of slowed down after the first quarter. The second quarter was a bit of a very slow quarter. And so we lost a bit of momentum there. And um, so that has sort of led to why we are seeing sort of a, a slower turn of growth. I think we are just 7.5% behind last year on the equity side. So I would basically attribute it to um, the market just maintaining its uh, sort of an equilibrium, uh, not, not really, nothing really much to excite the year. Uh, we had hoped to bring in some stimulating uh, uh, IPOs uh, that didn't work out, and we thought those were going to help. Uh, but I think it's uh, it was just market was just holding, and uh, investors were sort of just rebalancing their portfolios, uh, playing a, m a bit more into the fixed income side as opposed to equity. Uh, and what also contributed to that is that uh, the yields on the fixed income were very attractive throughout the year, so there was really no opportunity for the equity market to benefit from a reallocation of. Uh, capital all right speaking about a uh, intention to have some stimulating ipos coming over and which didn't materialize when you look at 2022 um we've already s received some indication from uh, players like santa marie never mind they're indicating they might be looking elsewhere what sort of pipeline might you be looking at and um are there domestic inhibiting factors which players are telling you if you address one two three we might consider coming on we have a pipeline that we've been working on for the past uh, three years, trying to really get um, issuers to come to the market. Uh, our primary focus for a long time was on government because we, we, we know there are quite some good uh, companies in there that can actually be able to come to the market and uh, really provide a, a reasonable quantum of, of, of um, shares to help the market really stimulate up. And so we put a lot of focus on that. Uh, we've also been talking a lot to the private sector uh, but that's been a bit of a, a difficult conversation because there are a lot of competing options that they are exploring. Uh, if you think about the banks, the private equity players, um, even the donor agencies are really participating in, 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 in funding corporates. So those have been our, 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 key, our key concerns. But looking in 2022, we, we have a pipeline. We are uh, very, very convinced that uh, we should be able to actualize two, two listings. Um, by the first half of this year, uh, we are very, very. We've been working on that, and uh, these are companies that um, have actually got clear objectives to do things in 2022, despite the elections. Uh, these are plans they had in place. They have. They basically want to actualize them. The, the, the transactions are actually very, very warm, so they need the capital, and so this first quarter should see maybe one company make a move towards um, coming to the market to raise money. So I'm, I'm we're optimistic about that. We're also hopeful that uh, the government will finally um, consider uh, doing something, possibly if not a listing, but a further sell down of, of an existing issuance, uh, largely because the privatization commission uh, appointments are progressing. And we hope that uh, once appointed, then there could be efforts towards uh, look at seeking uh, capital through the capital markets through a sell down or or maybe one issuance. So we're going to be focusing a lot on that. So I think with that, then the journey will begin. And possibly as we go to after the elections, when all everything starts to settle down, then a lot of players will come. Staying with the issue of issuances, one of the challenges that I have as a market watcher is that the issuances we're seeing coming on board are not reflective of the environment, if I could say. Let me give you an example. If you look at global equities right now, we have the tech stocks really coming strongly. Uh, players in the pharmaceuticals, the Modernas, etc., playing very strongly. But when you look at our listings, it looks like we are almost frozen in time. Uh, when you talk about a pipeline, are you seeing now a composition which you would say is reflecting the e-commerce penetration, 
the pharmaceutical space? Well, we've, um, how, we've, how we've been able to position the exchange is um, we are a very um, open capital raising platform, a very clear venue for raising capital of, of any nature. And we have got products that are very targeted towards specific sectors. Uh, and so we, we, we are engaging, especially with these new emerging sectors. The tech space <coughs> is a big area for us. Uh, we, are, we, are, we are working on how, even seeing how we can have further uh, incentive improvements to allow tech companies to come to the market. They're very unique in nature. They have very light balance sheets. They're more intellectually uh, led organizations. The assets are actually intellectual property and all this need to be. You need to configure out how to have them valued and, um, and, 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 and derive some valuation so that investors can actually be able to appreciate their value. So we are working on incentive structures, especially around tech companies, and really think about even coming up with a thematic board that's so unique to tech space and, and have that in place. So that's, that's a plan we have. Uh, and other sectors have also got targeted uh, products, for instance, real estate, et cetera. So um, on these new emerging sectors, uh, we have companies that we are engaging with and who are asking us how can, how can we help them raise capital. Um, I would not be able to say there's anything very, very significant at the moment in the pipeline. But I think with time, and especially this year as we put in and lay more focus and, and really bring, bring through some of these incentives, we should be able to attract uh, a couple of them to come through. A lot of them, um, first of all, intend to work, want to come through the private market. And we've got this uh, unquoted securities platform which is basically like, a, a, like an OTC for, 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 the, for the NSC. And that's where we think we'll position them first, uh, sort of have them there to prepare and strengthen themselves, still raise capital and get liquidity events when they want, and eventually migrate them to the main market. So we'll probably start there for now and, um, and, and see how that progresses. All right. Um, another question, Jeff, is that one of the hallmarks of um, 2021 yeah. was that day trading finally went live. Um, one month down the line, when you look at Aptic, how is the response like? How is it uh, contributing to your turnover at this point? And more importantly, one of the ideas behind day trading was to tap into a demographic which we felt was being left out in this market. Are you seeing that demographic being brought on board? Yeah. Yes, so uh, we launched day trading last year in November. And uh, within a month, we saw a 7% increase in turnover. Uh, the, the, the value of of that of that period was about 784 million in, in actually day day buy and sell trades, so that's a kind of uh, turnover we saw. Very very good uh, good start, um, and uh, I think the players have been waiting for this for a while, and uh, the 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 all, everything we did around making it happen has really excited the market. Uh, we we are, as you rightly put it, we are targeting a certain demographic, especially the youth, who who love momentum, who love um, high levels of volatility, who can appreciate volatility. Um, I think where we still have a bit of a handicap is the trading front ends that our brokers are using. Um, I think we, they need, a, lot, a lot of them need to develop apps that can allow um, onboarding, quick onboarding, quick account opening, um, uh, very, very user friendly. Just like we see around what, what happens on the forex trading side, that that level of of, of efficiency is, is desirous, and I think some of our trading members are thinking of changing their front ends to allow that to happen, and that should be able to see more and more uh, activity happen. Uh, the other issue is, um, I know a lot of them have come back with us with feedback to us about the the, the, the pricing, especially on the as we discussed on the second leg. Uh, we have already provided a discount as the exchange. And we're also trying to convince our other partners who, who benefit from levies to consider also providing some incentive to make it more efficient. I think what we're looking for is turnover. And so whatever price, uh, we, it has to be very, very cost effective to encourage that to happen. So I must say it's a very, very good start. What we intend to do this year is really provide a lot more education, a lot more visibility on what it's all about, um, a lot more engagement, trainings, etc., just to really make make it pick up, but uh, I think we're off to a very good start. Okay. Speaking about the discount on the second leg of the transaction, Jeff, I looked at the um, amount that NSC is offering. 
And I was like, really, is this the best that NSC can give? And one of the thoughts that crossed my mind was, NSC might be really struggling in terms of preserving its revenues because you give the discount, you're foregoing something. Was that a, a really challenging decision for you guys to take? So, um, you know, the, with day trading, um, cost is everything because the spreads are small. And so we were very conscious that we needed to come up with a certain, a certain level of discount as, as, a big, as a move to make this happen. And so we reduced our fees um, from the 0.12 to 0.114%. And our intention was to trigger uh, our core uh, partners to also follow suit and eventually try to make it more and more cost effectively. Now, we are looking at it because we're getting feedback. Um, we've got feedback, for instance, that um, is it possible for us to just charge on an aggregated basis as opposed to individual trades to make that cheaper? Uh, there are very, very other feedbacks about how can we make it extremely, um, very, very cheap. But again, we have uh, a commercial interest in the, in the, in the product. Uh, so we put a lot of investment behind it. We have put money in it. So we have to ensure that uh, there's a return that's also uh, commensurate to us. So it's something that we, we understand. It's something we hear. Um, and we are doing our own assessments. And I think we'll engage more. And once the data starts coming out like it's coming out now, We'll be able to, I believe our partners will be able to consider further reductions as well. You're quite spot on in saying that in day trading costs is everything, and I'm putting myself in a broker's shoes. Uh, one of the challenges that I'd imagine they're confronting is that um, do the volumes they witness compensate for the possibility of giving more attractive um, costs on their side? Because we know a number of brokers are struggling. And that's one of the issues they actually raised with me when uh, this was um, rolled out. So how do you see it playing out for them on their side? Because they are really grappling with this issue of the cost side. Um, that's a very good question, Julian. We've actually asked the brokers, why can they also consider <laughs> discounting their fees? Um, because, because they haven't. And I, think, and I think that's also contributing immensely to that. Um, but we appreciate that uh, it's been challenging times, especially for broking houses. Uh, the last two years have been extremely difficult. And so we, did, we didn't want to make um, a strong case for them to bring their fees down immediately. But I think what's going to happen is that competition will drive price down. Um, I can imagine a, broker, a broking house that will be, that, that'll be, that'll have very high levels of efficiency will actually be able to bring their price down faster than another brokerage house that probably has a heavy, a heavy cost base at the, end, at the back end. And so I think that's going to be the competitive nature is actually going to help uh, the price come down. So that's going to, that for me is going to be a natural event and I'm, I'm not too worried about it. Uh, but I think what this means is that a lot of our broking houses must try and see how they can make um, uh, their businesses more efficient, how they can also make their access points more available, um, provide research. Uh, to, to, to especially very, very readily available research to investors so that they're able to make those decisions quickly. So that's sort of what we expect to see going forward. Uh, our role was to provide ability, which we have. And so I think the other, the, the, the other thing just rests on, on, on the broken houses and how they can be able to make this more efficient from their end. Okay. Jeff, I'm really curious. What's the interplay between um, securities lending and borrowing? and day trading. And why I'm asking that question is because day trading by its nature would necessitate very liquid uh, markets because of the high momentum that you need for entry and exit. And here we rolled out SLB uh, to be able to unlock some of these um, shares which are held for long term and really in blocks. So are you, are you witnessing any interplay that this is facilitating day trading? Well, not for now. It, because SLB framework is just taking off now. Um, we have just had the uh, approved agents in place. Um, all the approvals have now been granted. They're out of the sandbox. And all this has been tested, but, but it's, it hasn't yet happened. What you're seeing right now are basically um, covered day tradings where people are basically selling what they already have and not naked. Uh, what will happen in the, in the long run is that uh, there's going to be an ability to, to actually short in the market, where you just go and, and uh, take a position in the market but with the intention to cover that using uh, borrowed securities. 
And that's where we're going to see that framework really to trigger off. And um, we think there's going to be great uh, flow coming through. One, why? Because a lot, this market has, a lot of the people who have invested in this market have taken long positions. So they've got these shares which they don't sell at all and which they earn nothing over. And the minute they're able to see that there's actually revenue to be made out of lending stock, then you're going to see this other side really, really trigger up. Because I'll be able to go to the market, sell what I don't have, come and borrow for settlement. So, you, so I mean, buy what I don't have and also borrow for settlement. So, you, so you're going to see that activity pick up quite well once this framework works. And I'm happy that at least the day trading is now active and it's building up. So the next thing will be how can we uh, go to the market, uh, exit a position and come and borrow. And so we have to expose, expect to see that happen a lot. Okay. In 2021, we also witnessed the partnership between Safaricom and the NSC Bonga Points for shares. How is that going? So this was part of our digital transformation strategy and uh, a lot of that is still ongoing. Um, I'm, I'm just glad to say that we turned around that in one month, very uniquely, uh, to get from conceptualization to, to launch was only 30 days. And working with Safaricom is, was, a great, it was a very, very great experience. So far, uh, we've seen conversions equivalent to 1.25 million shillings. So not, not what we expected. I mean, we've, Safaricom are sitting on a huge uh, amount of these uh, bonga points in the balance sheet and want to find a way of, of having those converted. Um, so it's, it's, it's been still very slow, I must say. Uh, and they told us, uh, d d don't be surprised. Uh, it's like Kenyans, it's like Kenyans keep bonga points as assets. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it'll take a lot, a lot of hammering, a lot of marketing to really convince them to convert them. And, and he challenged us I and mean, told us, how many bonga points do you have? And actually, when you look at your phone, you actually have bonga points. Um, so a lot of education, a lot of marketing around that, again, is what we're going to focus on in 2022 to make sure that people can actually um, take advantage of those opportunities. I can tell you, if, for instance, we got a big IPO today, a lot of those bonga points will be converted because people will now need cash to invest, especially if it's a stimulating IPO, a very exciting, a very big one. And I think that's, those are the kind of things that we hope to, to really help uh, this, this, this opportunity work. And so, yeah, so you should see a lot of campaign around it. But maybe the counter narrative to what you're saying, Jeff, is that uh, is a abysmal uptake an indication of um, something around your product innovation. Mm -hmm. Because Kenyans think of bonga points more as safety nets. So if you have a house elf or a guard who needs a phone and you just don't want to go to your, your liquid cash, then you, you wind that way. D does it speak to the manner in which the NSC goes through its product development? Well, all our innovations are informed by market needs. Uh, we do a lot of research, we carry out a lot of um, market study, uh, we speak to partners who, <coughs> who want us to do things for them. Uh, and, and these are all informed by that. Uh, there's no product we bring to the market that, is, that doesn't have a basis. We have a strong business case behind it, including projections on, on how we want to convert. And, uh, and, and, and that's, that's what's applied to all our products. So even for, for this Bonga Point thing, we are very confident that uh, with the right campaign uh, behind it, with the right um, need for or the right assets coming through the market, we'll see faster conversions. Um, and that's what we hope to do. Um, I must tell, you know, with every product, with every product there's a, what you call a gestation period. You cannot just launch a product and expect it to blow up or, or kick up, you know, overnight. It takes time to build. I, I, recall, I recall when we were, when m -Pesa came to the market. I mean, a lot of us bought in m -Pesa after three years. I mean, uh, today it's, it's now the big thing. So I think we give ourselves a lead time of maybe, say, three years to see how the market operates. And we consistently evaluate our products. So we have something we call our product um, uh, development committee that looks at all products and says, is this meeting our targets? Do we need to tweak it or do we need to, to suspend it or something like that, just to inform some of these decisions? One thing I must say is that you can't stop ideas whose time have come, especially innovations. This market would remain very, very thin uh, very local, not, not internationally flavored, 
Now we've got a derivatives market, we've got, um, uh, we've got SL, security lending and borrowing, day trading. So international investors come here and they're doing the assessments They say, do you take this, do you take this, do you take this? And that even promotes our existing products. They say then, I like this market because you actually are, very, are looking forward. The top leadership of the exchange made a trip to the JSE, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. And uh, we have seen a lot of increasing bilateral ties and engagements between Kenya and South Africa, including the much touted potential consolidation between KQ and SAA. Are we expecting any partnership at the exchange level between NSC and the JSE? So the NSC and the JSE have been <coughs> uh, working partners for many years. Um, when we were setting up some of our new markets, uh, like the derivatives market, all the technical support came from the JSC. Uh, when we were doing our, our, our looking for our technology to run our markets, again, we worked with the JSC and we're using the same systems again. So JSC has always been our partner in Africa because we believe that um, as a leading market in Africa, they have uh, sort of um, uh, the benefit of really being able to, to really understand the intricacies of, of, of good markets and, and very good standards. So, they are a natural partner. So we have an MOU, which we signed many years ago. I think it was around 2012, 2013 there, uh, which informed a lot of these relationships that we've been having over the years. And so we have, we went back on the sidelines of the meeting uh, to try and re-energize this MOU, find new ways of working, look for new opportunities of working together. And uh, they are very excited. In fact, we met the full top leadership there and uh, some of the things that we're looking at are cross-listings. Uh, they feel that uh, their market is getting is, is too mature now, and they, they think arbitrage might be the way to help investors in their markets also benefit. So you'll see companies that are listed there also cross-listed here. Just look for any arbitrage opportunities, and we hope to see that as, as a key thing. Uh, they've got a new focus on SMEs. Uh, we have got a focus on SMEs through Ibuka. Again, opportunities for collaboration uh, and working together. Our derivatives market uh, is very, very new. They are the only other derivatives market in Africa. Again, how we are learning how, how they were able to build and ramp up their numbers. And uh, South Africa is, as I call, a huge amount of capital that's looking for a home to invest. In fact, they were just saying there's so much money in this country. So we, we have to tap into that capital. And so we think those are the kind of relationships that we'll have. So we're strengthening. It's not new. We are strengthening our relationship. Um, we believe that um, uh, it's going to play a very big role, even in terms of helping the, the bigger agreements that were put in place. Uh, so for us, uh, it's, 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 it's a very good business uh, relationship that we're building together. All right. Let's now talk fixed income, which was really the sweet spot, in my view, last year. Uh, we saw a couple of uh, really investment-grade issuances, much to our delight. When I look into 2022, I'm a little worried because I've seen the yield curve going up, the sovereign yield curve for that matter. And I'm wondering for the corporates who are now coming in, won't pricing be a problem for them? Just to reflect back to 2022, 2021, uh, Julian, you're right. It was a, a great year. Three assurances, all successful, with the last one extremely <laughs> successful. <laughs> um, and, and for us, why that was good, a good event is that it, it sort of puts us at a point of recovery. Don't forget that this market had gone through a very serious challenge with uh, some two issuances. And so this just, again, just speaks to the fact that the market is deep enough, people are looking for credible assets, and they're willing to support. And uh, when you looked at the last one, the EABL, a lot of investors in that EABL uh, were institutional funds, were uh, the banking sector, and retail. There's a huge amount of retail. And uh, we've always been putting a case that uh, we need a lot of retail to participate in the market to, to really enhance also the secondary market trading. And we hope that the EABL bond will be traded because I think that's also going to be um, a good sign um, that the markets can be used efficiently, especially for on the secondary side. Now, having said that, uh, you're right. The yields have, have, have sort of moved up, and so it's probably pricing will be a bit, a, bit, a bit expensive than last year. But I think in the overall scheme of things, uh, if you price in the fact that a lot of issuances, especially if they're issuers, if they're credible, they can actually get this money unsecured. And so compared to 
getting a bank financing, this still remains a cheaper source of funding. Uh, and we expect to see that, that happen. A lot of them, again, price off the sovereign, slightly above the sovereign. And if it's a very credible issuer, it gets very close to sovereign. And um, I think we, we hope to see those kind of players coming in. Um, what, again, I want to say is that uh, the, the, the corporate debt market um, helps companies also begin the journey towards um, complying with listing requirements. You see, because once you do a, a corporate issuance, you're expected to meet certain obligations. And that helps you already begin being a very um, transparent company, helping you comply with listing requirements. You start feeling the, the, the effects of regulation. And, and eventually, this should help you also um, find it easier to convert into a full listing. And so we, we think that's, that's, a, that's a market that we like so much, and we believe this is where we're going to focus more. Um, we hope to see a lot of um, institutions raise money through this market, both in government and public, in public and private, and uh, help this market grow faster. Okay. Uh, Jeff, speaking about the necessity of catalyzing retail participation in fixed income, any thoughts around uh, Emma Kiba and why I'm asking that is because for a number of stakeholders I've spoken to, their take home is one. Emma Kiba was a brilliant product, not properly structured. And uh, the argument has been perhaps we should have structured it as a collective investment scheme as opposed to reaching out to the various retail investors individually. Any thoughts on that, Jeff? Yes, Emma Kiba was a very innovative idea. We still think it's, in, it's, it's exciting. Uh, people are asking us when is the next issuance. Uh, the government is looking at how to uh, revise the structure. Uh, we are not part of the conversations as yet. Um, I think they're looking at, at uh, other, other options. But that, that technology and, and, and structure is something that we're not going to uh, sort of um, let go. We believe we can be able to also use the same uh, technology to do corporate bonds, for instance. And uh, to your point about having uh, debt assets come through our collective investment schemes is really the way to go. Uh, we are fully supportive of that. Uh, and so we, we want to work with issuers to see how, how that can happen, to have more, for instance, corporate debt paper come through um, a CIS structure, which then is supported by an Emma Kiba platform for onboarding and settlement. And then that's the kind of thing we're looking at. So we're going to be looking at that. It's, it's a way to go. I must tell you that um, the, the lessons we learned from Emma Kiba were very, very good. This is one market that uh, we saw very easily onboarding, very easy secondary market trading, very easy payment of, of interest and coupons, and finally, maturities. We did not get any glitch or any failures in all those aspects. So this just tells you it was a successful product. The, pr the problem was uh, lack of full-blown marketing and education, which was a big issue. Probably the structure was not um, very, very attractive to investors. But I think as we, it's something that we can improve on to help get the retail back to the market. Okay. Jeff, uh, something I'd like to spend some time on. I am aware of uh, the plan to set up a structure which essentially, you could correct me if I'm wrong, takes fixed income activity away from the Nairobi Securities Exchange. And that is via the EABX platform, which you and I know is already recruiting a chief executive officer. What does this mean for the exchange? I shudder the thought of NSC with only equities and not fixed income. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> our, our recollection of the intentions of setting up um, another exchange where I think was, was mooted some years back by um, a study done by one of the um, donor partners about a hybrid market in Kenya, saying that um, the Kenyan market could, could actually grow faster if it was a hybrid market, uh, meaning that it had an exchange-traded uh, debt market and an over-the-counter traded debt market. So that was the plan. Uh, we were initially involved in those conversations just to understand what the plan was and maybe are there any, any areas that we could also contribute positively to, uh, towards. Uh, the conversation then has been going on quietly uh, and now we're seeing the, 
uh, a bond, an, an OTC bond exchange is being established. Now, we think um, that we've got a very good debt market in Kenya. We've, be, we've built a very good market over the years. Today, we have got the, we, if, we, if we're not the, we could be the second highest, um, uh, the second exchange in Africa with the highest turnover of sovereign debt paper. The largest exchange is, uh, is, is JSC because they trade a lot of corporate debt. But when it comes to sovereign or government securities, we could be second in Africa. Now with that, what have we done to just uh, help uh, our, second, our fixed income side market grow? One, we have fully automated this market. Uh, all securities are dematerialized, meaning that everything is being held in electronic form uh, with the central bank. We have reduced the trading cycle from three days to a day. And in a day, we are, trade, we are doing al almost three cycles of, of trades. You can buy and sell three times uh, in, on the same day. Ease of settlement. We have worked with our partners, uh, Refinitiv, to provide uh, a platform for negotiating and, and agreeing on transactions through a call, a call, a call platform, which, which makes it very easy for, for trades to be confirmed securely through channels like that. Um, everything is happening extremely well. The, and, and hence, we have a very good secondary market. And that just explains why even last year, our turnovers went up 38% from 691 to 9, 956 billion shillings. And uh, we've helped the government raise money easily because of the ex ability to provide good exits. So we've done everything right. Um, so we don't, we, 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 we at the exchange did not see the need for a second exchange. I think we could just build on this, see how we can um, provide avenue for other players to come in. We have got a license that allows none, none, uh, other, other players like banks to come in directly and connect and trade. And so in our view, having a second exchange does not merit initially. And the other argument we put across is that you'll have disparities in pricing. I mean, you've got two securities that might trade at different yields here. How do you uh, merge those yields and come up with a, a standard platform. The NSC is, the NSC yield is what is used for pricing assets. Yeah. And hence, we, we, think, we thought that there's need for us to maintain our repository role uh, for, for trade, as a trade repository for purposes of that. But having said that, probably the, we think there were maybe overriding considerations and feeling that we should actually get a second exchange on board. Um, so we, are, we know that there's going to be competition, but we have to maintain our leadership and maintain our, our focus in getting our market to remain uh, where it is as, as of now. So we welcome competition. <laughs> the challenge is that we don't know. Um, <clears throat> we, we still believe that uh, there should be complementary roles that we have to work together. We've seen this model in Nigeria between the FMDQ and the, the Nigerian Stock Exchange, and uh, we wait to see how that will evolve. But uh, I can tell you from the very outset, uh, as an NSC, we didn't see the, the merit in having a second exchange in a market that is still this young, and, and then create these uh, two, two, two scenarios uh, that might uh, present other problems. We don't know. Suppose the fixed income is actually hived off from the exchange. What would this mean for you from a revenue standpoint? So right now, the fixed income contributes about 7% of our total revenue. Um, it's, it, it is significant for us uh, because we have every plan. We have every, we have every plan to grow that revenue stream to make it, take it to over ten percent or close to fifteen percent of total revenue. So we, we we take it as a very important asset class for the exchange. Uh, but uh, the reason why we even diversified our product offerings is because we wanted to de-risk our business from a concentration of two two asset classes. So we've got equities and, and fixed income for many years. So the reason we have derivatives, ETFs, and all these other products is to then try and concentrate uh, our revenue streams and have more other, other, other products contributing. So in the long run, if all our other products pick up, then I think we, we don't have a real risk because we have other new stream, revenue streams that can help support our business. Uh, but that, that possibly will take time. Uh, but in the, medium, in the immediate term, then, we need to be very, very um, aware that we need to work hard to retain our market share because uh, we'll sort of lose a bit of it uh, to the market and find out we're just keeping our market share 
uh, through this. The other thing, the other focus for us is to go regional and to really bring in regional uh, companies to come in uh, for on existing products and new products and more collaborations across the continent to also diversify income streams. So we, we, are, we, we, we are now out of our, uh, what do you call it, comfort zone, comfort zone. <laughs> and really have to, we've been shaken out to go and do more to protect our business. What would you say to the view that uh, the necessity of this move is the fact that uh, the NSC, from a turnover standpoint, has become so fixed income centric, there is need to carve it out and create ample space for focus, dedicated focus on equities and how to grow this well, space? Um, I, I would not say that um, we are fixed income centric. I think we, we, we're just going through uh, a normal market cycle where um, our fixed income markets are doing very, very well um, compared to our equity markets. Um, our, our primary objective is to help our equity market grow. We, that's, that's really our bread and butter. And, and so we put all our energies there to, 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 to achieve that. Um, so I don't, think there was a, I don't think the objective was to help NSE get out of any comfort <laughs> per se. I think it's, 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 it's informed by the fact that I think when they look at other markets like South Africa, uh, they find that uh, the debt market is very big. And possibly the argument then was that um, uh, just leaving it as an exchange alone um, we, and, 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 and the structure that we have where all trades are traded through broking houses and, and all this, that there was need for a separate market that trades differently. Maybe that will trigger the market to turn over better. So those are really the overlying objectives. I think the argument then was they feel that the, 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 trade, the investors need to trade directly more together. That's why they're creating a bilateral trading way, a platform. Uh, they thought the cost of trading is higher because you're going through brokers. Um, they were saying that the depth is not, the market is not so visible from a depth perspective. I think those are the, those are the arguments. But uh, we, we have solutions to all those, all those concerns. But uh, they, 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 decide, they still made the decision to move forward. So we'll take it on. We'll take it on. Jeff, I'm seeing our time is for us, but let's wrap up this conversation. Um, looking into 2022, just give us your general outlook. Many guys are looking and wondering. Uh, we have the twin risks of COVID-19 still with us. We have an election cycle coming up. What's your outlook for the market? <coughs> so we've taken a, um, a sort of a, fa a fairly, I would say, a muted opti optimism on this, on this year. Um, why I say muted is that it's an election year. Uh, you could have all these strong plans, but uh, how the elections play out is, is different. Kenyan's elections are very interesting events and uh, can actually run a long time. <laughs> we are hopeful that this time the, the frameworks and everything will be much better so that we can get the elections done with. I'm happy it's a media event, not, a, not an NDA event. Otherwise, we would be on campaigns from January to December. I'm happy it's a media event. Um, and so we are holding a, very, a, 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 a fair optimism on the market. We are focusing on getting our objectives achieved, be they the listings, be they turnovers, be they new products uptakes. <coughs> You'll see that same momentum, that same pressure to, to achieve that, because for us it's business as usual. We believe that um, political risk is going to be priced in very well. Uh, investors understand this when they do their investment decisions. And so we're not very worried about volatility in a big way. Uh, people normally think we'll see big swings. I must tell investors, buy now. If you're waiting for further discount, I'm sorry. Uh, investors, take, they price this one year in advance. So you might not see very high volatility. So this is a good time to buy. And so, um, and I think Kenyans are becoming very aware about other opportunities of creating wealth. And I think the capital markets will, will provide that. I'm really excited about the diaspora. They, they're keen on getting back to, to invest in their home country. That's going to be a big focus area for us, how to get diaspora in uh, through platforms that are helpful and more marketing out there. Um, we're focusing a lot on our alternative platform, the Unquoted Securities platform. You'll see a number of issuance come there as well to raise money. And so for us, it's a positive year. We are looking, looking strong. Uh, but again, we're very conscious that um, it's because the twin risks that you talk about are real. So we also have to manage our cost structures. And so a lot of, a lot of that has to be in place. But um, 
yeah, we've seen uh, many elections and uh, we hope it will go well too. So. Final question, Jeff. Now that you've mentioned the diaspora, um, looking at the strength and resilience of the remittances, even in a very risk and risky environment like COVID-19, sometimes I wonder to myself, could Kenya be getting late or missing the boat of a diaspora bond? Yes, um, that's a good question because it's been a long time coming. Um, I, think, I think it's something that we should go ahead with. Uh, there's a huge interest in, in that, especially looking at the remittances. Um, Kenyans would like to have an asset class out there that's unique to them. Uh, and the experience is good, especially the fact that we've done enough euro bonds. So if you're looking at how to manage the currency risk, I think that has been, that's, that's, that's now something that the issue that the government is familiar with. And I think they need to start thinking about putting in place a diaspora bond in place. We as the NSC are willing to partner and help them structure it and find a way of even having it listed to create uh, ability to have liquidity. Because we have a huge diaspora out there, they're looking for assets. <clears throat> We've been trying to educate the public that I think Kenyans need to change their investment philosophy from brick and mortar and get into uh, assets like this in the capital markets that uh, provide you with more safety, especially if you're out there, and more liquidity, yeah? especially if you're out there. Yeah. So something like a diaspora bond is something we are, we are really, um, we we'll be very happy if it can, if it can happen in, in very shortly. Right, unfortunately, that takes us to the close of our conversation with Jeff Adundo, focusing on Capital Markets Outlook 2022. We shall continue highlighting emerging issues as far as corporate actions are concerned.